Welcome back to the Bedside Bedtime with Cousin Vinny series, uh, run exclusively on YouTube. I'm Cousin Vinny Agnello, critically acclaimed Christian author. I wrote The Devil's Glove, which we are about to read about 180 pages in 15 minute segments, and last night I left you off on page 87, I think. So we're getting our, we're making progress here. Oh, I, I, it dawned on me that you guys might want to have my phone number in order to order an autographed copy from me or at least get the details. So that's sitting up right there. You see my phone number and my email address. So now that we've done that, you can watch that all through the broadcast. Let's get back to the Devil's Glove. Alrighty, yesterday I left you off with... Uh, Billy and, uh, well, the dream coach, of course, who's Billy Green, and uh, Eddie Romano as they were, uh, as Eddie got a chance to meet the manager, uh, the um, very, very unfriendly, the manager guy. Anyway, here we are on page 86, and uh, Eddie Romano says, that's what I like about you. Never a straight answer. You're like a nice Freddy Krueger, you know that? I'm afraid you lost me, kid. I'm not quite up to date with, uh, what'd you call him? Freddy Krueger? You'll have to tell me more, more about him some other time. But right now we got baseball to learn. Okay, now here's the situation. You got a runner on second and one out. The ball's hit to you. What do you do? I uh, check the runner, and then I throw to first. Absolutely. Why do you check the runner? Because I don't want him to advance. I want to freeze him at second and get the out. Exactly. You want to take some batting practice? Sure, I did exactly what you told me to, to do today. I went to bat real aggressive-like, and I took control of the plate. I stood so close to the plate that the pitcher threw at me. I told you that was going to happen, didn't I? You sure did, and believe me, I got out of the way fast. Good boy. Now remember, keep your head down and your eyes focused. Try to read the laces of the ball as they approach the plate. Don't forget to crouch. Remember, crouching shortens the strike zone. Make sure you sit. That me means keeping all your weight on your back foot. That gives you leverage when you swing the bat. Only when you swing do you step out onto your front foot and shift that weight forward. That will give you increased power. And why do you get practically on top of the plate? Because if you do, your bat can reach the outside corner. That way you don't get struck out on any unhittable pitches. Absolutely correct. Kid, you've got a great memory. You must have done great in practice. Eddie smiled and was overjoyed that he was receiving praise from his coach. He then stepped into the batter's box and crowded the plate while awaiting the pitch. Suddenly, the manager came out of the dugout to observe. His presence so alarmed the coach that he aborted throwing the pitch. He suddenly stopped in the middle of his wind-up and asked Eddie, in order for the glove to perform its magic, what must you do? Uh, I gotta wish my teammates bad luck, right? Before the ball player could respond, an old man with beautiful white hair walked out onto the field and approached the group. An ethereal light surrounded him. My son, why are you preaching falsehoods to this boy? The old man asked in a divine tone of voice. The ball player was speechless. A look of recognition flashed across his face. Suddenly he gathered himself together and said, Michael, what are you doing here? The man in the dark suit rudely interrupted what was beginning to be a tearful reunion. Get out of here, old man. This isn't your place. Go back to where you came from. We don't need you here. I see the deceiver still has a hold on you, my boy, 
Michael deduced. Leave, old man, or you will experience my wrath. And tell your boss that he's nothing compared to me. And tell him that I will make him pay if he keeps interfering with my business. Yes, I will leave, not because of your idle threats, but because I cannot stand for very long the stench of your effluvium. But I will be back. I'm here to let you know that we intend to fight for this child, Michael forewarned. Ed, Eddie suddenly awakened from this confusing dream by the ringing of the telephone. He picked up the receiver and groggily said, <clears throat> Hello? Hi, Eddie. I was told to give you a call. The voice on the other end sounded oddly familiar. Who is this? You know who it is. <laughs> I know who it sounds like. It sounds like who it is. So you expect me to believe that it's Babe Ruth, right? I expect you to believe the truth, the babe stated. You're dead, though. Yeah, I know. So, uh, where are you calling me from? Heaven? Good guess. Don't be a smartass. Well, what do you want? I've been told that you need some help with your hitting. This is just great, Eddie announced in disbelief. Let's get real. You expect me to believe that Babe Ruth is calling me to be my personal hitting instructor? Yeah, but that would be only telling you half the truth, kid. You see, my friend Lou Gehrig is going to give you some tips, too, Ruth stated frankly. Sure, I'd love to hear Gehrig give me a few tips. Is he going to be calling me from heaven, too? Eddie asked sarcastically. Sure is. Would you like to talk to him, kid? Yeah, why not? Put him on the phone. Hi, Eddie. I really did feel like the luckiest man on the face of the earth that day at Yankee Stadium. And I feel very lucky that I've been chosen to help you with your hitting, Garrett stated humbly. You both sound so authentic. But this just can't be. Somebody's pulling my leg, Eddie reasoned. <clears throat> this is no joke. Life is a miracle, son. And so is death. It's a whole new ball game. If you can believe in God, you can believe in us. I remember that when I was alive, I always tried to figure out why we existed. It didn't make any sense then. I remember taking the universal questions back as far as possible and asking myself, how could God just be? You know what I mean? If God created the world, then who created God? There was no answer then. And the only answer I can tell you now is that God was always there. Illogical? Yes. Improbable? No way. Anyway, Eddie, we've been told to look out for you and to give you the best baseball hitting instruction that's ever been given, at least in my humble opinion. If you want it, we're prepared to give it to you. But unlike in your dreams, with us, you call the shots, kid, Garrick articulated. Why all this interest in me? Because you're in a very special situation. Can't you be any more specific than that? I'm sorry, Eddie. I've said all that I can say. It's your destiny. We're only here to try to steer you in the right direction. But we're not allowed to influence your final decision. Only you can make those choices. You know, I, I, can't, I can't get a straight answer out of any of you guys, but I think I'm getting it. This is like the Flintstones, right? You two are like my guardian angels, the voices that try to tell me to do good, and my dreams are like the devil trying to tell me to do bad. It sounds like these Flintstones have a good handle on things, Eddie. I always knew it, Mr. Gehrig. Life is like a cartoon. Now all I need is the great gazoo to help me sort out this mess. 
Whatever you say, Eddie, Gerriger responded in confusion. Now, Eddie, fill me in on any hitting problems you have. Well, Mr. Gerrig, I've been getting good hitting instructions in my dreams lately, so what I probably need help on is like fine-tuning my swing, stuff like that. I'm playing a game on Saturday. Maybe you and the babe could stop by and make sure my mechanics are in order. We'll do that, Eddie. We won't be there physically, but we'll be watching the game. And we'll call you on the payphone if you're doing anything wrong. Good. There's a payphone right near the dugout. I'll tell you what to do. After every turn at bat, take a stroll over to the phone. Pick up the receiver and we'll be on the line, okay? Wow! This sounds great. You got yourself a deal until Saturday, Eddie said, wearing the biggest grin he'd ever plastered upon his face. The phone line suddenly went back to a dial tone, and Eddie headed out of his room totally energized with a vibrant spring in his step. Knowing he was late as usual, he raced down the stairs to get to the dining room for his evening meal. Mrs. Romano heard her son's approach through the creaking of the wooden stairs. Well, it's about time. Your father is here, and I just took the chicken out of the oven, she said with a frown on her face. Eddie, Eddie turned the corner and entered the kitchen, happy-go-lucky. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Mr. Romano looked up momentarily from his meal, spotted Eddie wearing his green glove, and quickly went back to devouring his breast of chicken. With his mouth full, he asked, Why do you have to bring your glove to the dinner table? Can't you leave it in your room? What if somebody steals it? Mr. Romano finished swallowing and asked, Who's going to steal it, Eddie? There's only you, me, and Mom. I'm certainly not going to steal it, and I can guarantee you your mother has no interest in it. His father's criticism stung and caused his whole world to suddenly crumble. Eddie, who just a moment ago was on top of the mountain, found himself in the deepest valley and couldn't cope with it, so he began to cry. As Eddie ran from the kitchen, his dad got up from the table and chased after him, finally catching up to him at the stairs. Eddie, what's wrong with you? Just forget what I said, okay? If it means that much to you, then you just bring it to the dining dinner table. I I'm sorry. Eddie started to get his composure back again. His mother appeared near the stairs and commented, See, Vince? This is just another example of what I've been talking to you about. I'm telling you, there's something definitely wrong. Lucy, he's calm. Let's just drop it now, okay? Mr. Romano comforted Eddie, holding him tightly in his arms. He then picked him up and carried him into the kitchen. He sat Eddie down in his chair, and the family continued to eat their meal. Eddie immediately began to devour his chicken breast. See, Lucy? The boy still has his appetite. Good chicken, huh, Eddie? Mmm, real good. So your mother tells me that you like those recordings I bought you. She tells me you play them all the time. They're great, Dad. Both Ruth and Garrick are going to help me out with my hitting. Well, that's great, son, his father said patronizingly. Speaking about batting, how practice go today? Oh, it went great. I'm finally becoming a good hitter, and it's all because of my new glove. Well, Eddie, I'm sure it has something to do with you, too. No, it's the glove, Dad. Guess what? What, Eddie? Mr. Ruth and Mr. Garrett told me they're going to watch my game from heaven on Saturday. What'd they do? Call you up and tell you that? Mr. Romano joked. Yeah, they called me just a little while ago. They're going to help me with my hitting. Great! I'm sure you'll improve a lot under their tutelage, Mr. Romano said, humoring his son. With all the good coaching I've been getting, I'm going to end up being the best ball player on my team. Didn't I tell you, Lucy? 
that I thought that Mr. Mitchell was a hell of a good coach. You sure did, dear. Dad, I'm not talking about Mr. Mitchell. I'm talking about my dream coach. He's really nice, and he's given me all kinds of good tips to improve my game. Eddie, you're something else, you know that? You literally eat, sleep, and dream baseball, don't you? Mr. Romano inquired in an amused tone of voice. I do, Dad. The way things are going, I'm going to be a major leaguer, too. You sure will. And if for any reason that doesn't work out for you, then maybe you should really think about becoming a writer, since you've really...